been going to be going to be wrapping up one of the lessons here today. We'll start with our our memory verse, which we have kind of been quoting this whole time. The in, the entirety of the study has really been all about this. It's Galatians five sixteen. So let's say the reference, then the verse, and then the reference, shall we? Galatians five sixteen. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5.16. So, it, we, we talked about this. This is a promise. I'm going to have to get used to having the screen on this side here. That's, uh, we've got a promise from God that, that if we do what he says, if we follow his commands, again, we, we've likened this to a, a hot air balloon, if you get in the basket... You can you can float. You can you can overcome the law of gravity. If if you stop being in the basket, then then you're on your own, and you, in and of your own power, don't have the ability to do that. In lesson seven, we've been looking at the filling of the spirit. Again, it's a truth that means we must reckon upon, meaning to count it as fact, to to acknowledge the fact, like like when you get to the end of the month. And you're, you're balancing your checkbook or you're, you're uh, kind of uh, reconciling your statements. You acknowledge what is fact, what, you, what went out and what came in. And you, you have to make those work together. The same idea when we get here to Galatians 5.16, we have to reckon it as fact. We have to reckon the filling of the Spirit as fact. Because sometimes it doesn't feel that way, does it? Sometimes you don't feel like you have the, the ability in Christ to overcome the, the flesh, to overcome the, the world, the flesh, the devil, all of the things that are pulling on us. But Jesus promised that if he returned to the Father, he would send a comforter. We looked at this in John 14. And Jesus kept his promise. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost and, and indwelt believers uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? My members, the flesh, blood, and bone that you see standing in front of you today is indwelt by the Spirit of God. If I'm going to do right in this life, I'm going to do right using the body, right? It's not, God's not talking about some uh, high in the sky, super spiritual. Well, if you, if you walk in the spirit, then you'll have this mystical experience. No, it's if you walk in the spirit, you can experience daily victory in the body that you dwell in. That's what God promises to us. Last week, we also looked at some biblical illustrations of what a life lived in the power of the Spirit looks like. Galatians, or I'm sorry, Ephesians 5.18 says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Just as someone who drinks is brought under the influence of that, that controlling substance, so you and I are to allow ourselves to be controlled, to be brought under the influence of the Holy Spirit of God. Colossians Four, verse 6 says, And let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Again, we're just reviewing, so I'm going past. The, the idea here, when I am filled with the Spirit, and when Mark is filled with the Spirit, it's not that we become the same person. It's that the Holy Spirit takes me and my personality and the way that I am, the Holy Spirit takes Mark and his personality and the way he is, and uses both of us to the fullest extent that we will allow him to. That's, that's the way that it works. Just as when you season meat, it brings out the taste of the meat. When you season your vegetables, it brings out the taste of, of the vegetables. We also spoke about hindering the work of the Spirit last week. We talked about 1 Thessalonians 5.19. It says, quench not the Spirit. Ephesians 4 verse 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. How do we quench? How do we grieve the Holy Spirit? Sin. Sin, yeah. What happens when I grieve the Holy Spirit? What, what happens when I, when I allow sin into my, into my life? What happens to my, my walk of victory? It's gone, right? I don't have victory. If I'm walking in sin, I don't have it. 
Uh, Psalm 66, verse 18. We talked about this a little bit last week. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. To regard, meaning to look at, to gaze on, to, to, to think about how nice it is. When I allow sin to have a place of honor in my heart and in my life, then I am, I am not in a place where the Lord can use me as he would want to. James chapter 4, verse 6. We'll look at this again in our morning service. It says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. When I allow pride into my life, when I allow sin into my life, when I have, let's, let's call it a pet sin, when I have, well, this is, this is just kind of how I am. I, I struggle with this. We talked about besetting sins a little bit last week. When, when I say, well, you know, it's just my besetting sin. I'll never get victory. So why should I even try? When I, when I make that, that mental surrender and I say, you know what? This is just, this is just how it's going to be. I'm taking myself out of the, of the path on which God can bless me because God doesn't bless sin. God's not going to bless me if I say, well, you know, I, I, think, I, can, I think I can work uh, this part of my life according to my will and I'll give God everything else. We gave the, the statement from Hudson Taylor that he's either Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. There's no such thing as, as partial, partial surrender. It's absolute. It's supposed to be total. But when we find ourselves in sin, because do you, do you struggle with sin? A little bit sometimes? <laughs> I hope I'm, not, hope I'm not the only one. I struggle with sin. What, what do we do when we find ourselves in sin? Well, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful, he's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What does it mean to confess? You remember we, we gave the Greek word is the idea of to, to say the same thing. It's to completely agree with God. When I see my sin and I say, ah, it's not that bad. That's not confession. When I see my sin and I say, this is something that hung Christ on the cross. That, that's, when I'm, that's when I'm understanding. I can truly confess. I can say, Lord... Forgive me. It's not just a little slip up. It's a problem in my life and I need to deal with it. So that kind of brings us up to everything that we've covered thus far in this lesson. Now we come to page 168 and we see the walk of faith. Spiritual growth is going to be experienced when I step out in faith and obedience on the truth and on the promises of Scripture. So let's come to Romans 1, verse 16, and we read, uh, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So, Looking at this passage right here, Romans 1, 16 and 17, question number one on page 168, how does the gospel affect the way that we live? How does the gospel affect the way that you live, not, not just on, in church on Sunday, but Monday and Tuesday? How does the gospel affect the way that you live? How does, how does this truth affect you tomorrow and this afternoon? Well, it changes you. Changes you? Take, takes away that, that shame. It says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, uh, for it's the power of God unto salvation. When, when we, when we uh, allow the gospel to affect us the way that the gospel will, it takes away that that. Uh, that inhibition. Well, I, I don't know if I should share this. I don't know if I should. I don't know if I should share the gospel. We we step out in faith. Question number two on page one sixty eight. What will happen to us when we focus our attention on the glory of God? This is from Second Corinthians chapter three verse eighteen. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, we're, we're going to break this down over the, over the next uh, couple of pages here in, in your Bible study book, page 168, 169, 170. 
We start off with our attitude, which is the phrase, but we all with open face. Open face. What does it mean to be open face? Honest. If I was to stand here before you and I was to say, "Look, I'm going to be, I'm going to be completely open with you," what, what am I, what am I saying? I, I'm going to, I'm going to lay it all out for you. I'm going to explain. This is, this is reality. This is how it is. I'm not holding anything back. I'm not covering anything up. I'm going to tell you. Look, this is how it is, and that's what this. Our attitude towards, towards Christ is. We, we behold. We all with open. Face. He says on page 168, it is only as, as we are ready to fully live in the obedience to the voice of God and the faith of Jesus that our life can grow. Again, there's no level of, of spirituality. There's no level of spiritual proficiency that's required. God is looking for people who will come openly and honestly and say, Lord, I need you because I'm completely and totally insufficient in and of myself. Before I get away from it, I want to want to mention to you this quote that we have here. It's on page 168. He took it from the book Holiest of All by Andrew Murray. I cannot recommend highly enough this book. If you are looking for a Bible study aid to take you through the book of Hebrews, how many of you would say, Hebrews, it's kind of like a black hole in the middle of the New Testament? It, I, for years, that was kind of how I felt. I, I've, I've read through Hebrews I don't know how many times, but it's so much, so many word pictures and so much symbolism. This book is a tremendous uh, study aid to go through that. I went through it, and I think it probably, I, I went through it very slowly. I think it took me about a year, and uh, he has it broken down, I think, into four verse segments. And you go through, and, and reading that passage, it is just a tremendous Bible study aid. wanted to mention that to you before we got away from this. So, we come to the Lord with an open face. It doesn't mean that I'm perfect. But it does mean that I'm open and honest before the Lord. Complete surrender. Again, it's, it's me coming and saying, Lord, you have access to every area of my life. When I got here to the school, I got some keys so that I could get in and get around. And uh, I, have, I have the key that opens the, the crash bars on the doors that you can open. I have the key that opens the front door, a, a, a tab. And then I have this key. <coughs> And, and it opens some doors, but it doesn't open all of them. I, I was walking around last night, and I was trying to get into I didn't know where a room was, so I was trying doors. And I realized this key doesn't open everything. There are The school is keeping secrets from me. The school has not been totally surrendered to Independent Bible Church. They're holding back on us. That's okay. But I, could, I shouldn't come into the presence of God and I say, Lord, I'll give you everything, but I've got this, I've got this, this closet. And that's where, I keep, that's where I keep my stuff. Lord, you can, have, you can have the public part of me, but I'm going to keep a, a few of the, the, private, the private sins, a few of the private areas that, that I want to hold, uh, hold sway over. That's not what this is talking about. That's not coming to the Lord with an open face. I should come to the Lord and say, Lord, here's, here's the key to everything. And you've got access to everything. And if you want to open the doors and, and, and find stuff, does God already know? Yeah, It's kind of silly for me to hold back, isn't it? Because God already knows what's there. God knows all of the sin in my life. And, and for me to act like I'm keeping secrets... It really doesn't make any sense anyway. But I come to the Lord, not, not perfect. I'm not a perfect person. You're not perfect people. We come to the Lord with open and honest face. And that's our attitude as we come before the Lord. Our action is found in the next phrase. He says, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. The word glory is the idea of a brilliant light. I'm to come to the Lord openly and honestly and he's going to shine the glorious light into all of the dark corners of my life. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15 says, Which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, 
the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who, hath, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. God dwells in light. I had one of my, my, my middle daughters, Sabrina, came in to my office this past week, and she said, Dad, how, and she, she, I don't remember exactly how she phrased it. She wanted me to explain the Trinity to her. That's a tall order. So I, I, I sat down and said, well, honey, uh, and I, I pulled out a piece of paper and I drew a triangle and I was trying to explain it and, and, and make, you know, this, there's one God in three persons. But essentially when I got to the end of it, I said, honey, it doesn't make sense. Daddy doesn't fully understand it. You can't fully understand it. It's beyond our ability to understand it. And she would say something like, what's ability? Uh, so the, that was kind of the, the conversation that we had. And then she came in a couple days later, and she'd been thinking about it. And she's, I had told her that no man can see God, right? Because the Bible says so. And she, she came in, and she said, Dad, how could they hang Jesus on the cross if they couldn't see him? And I realized, well, I need to do some more explaining here. They can see Jesus. Why could they see Jesus? He's a man, right? Because he's 100% man, 100% God. But you can't see God the Holy Spirit, and you can't see God the Father. Why? Because God's a spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But when God does reveal himself to man in a visible fashion, it's as light. It's as bright light that they can't, you can't see it. You can't look at it. And so here we come into the presence of God with an open face, completely and totally surrendered to, to the Lord. But we see his glory, it says, at beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. What is, what is a glass as it is used in scripture here? What would be another, another word for it? A mirror. A mirror. I go into the presence of God. And, and I'm not able to look directly at God. I can't look at God. Nobody can point and say, right there is God the Father. Because what? Because God the Father is omnipresent. He's everywhere, and no man can see God. But I can see God as I, as I get into his word. Because God's word is, is, is written to reveal God to me. I can see God in other believers who have the Spirit of God within them. When we get together and we're, we're fellowshipping and you can feel the presence of God in this place, even though this is not our normal place. Can, can the Spirit of God be here? He is here. Why? Because he said where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So I can see God. Uh, not not his person because he's a spirit, but I can see God in his word. I can see him in in other believers. I can see God as I listen to his word preached. I can see God in his sovereign control over the events of my life. Have you ever come through a, a very close shave of, of something that almost got you? You almost died. You almost got hurt, and you come out the other side, and you say, boy, God was looking out for me right there. God did that. And so God reveals himself, but we don't see the, the actual hand of God come down and move things, but we see the evidence of God all around us. So I'm striving to know facts about, about God uh, and to know God in reality. I can know facts about someone without knowing them personally. I could know facts about God without knowing him personally. But my goal is to establish a relationship with him, which starts with my attitude. I come to him and I say, Lord, you've got access to everything. I'm putting everything out on the table. Lord, you do with me whatever you want. And then I'm able to behold his glory. Okay, The, the glory of God as it's seen in all of the events around me. Then we come to our alteration. We are changed into the same image from glory to glory. What image? What image am I becoming more like? Like Christ. Remember what sanctification is? It's the Spirit of God taking the Word of God to make a child of God like the Son of God. And that's what happens. When I come to the Lord, I say, Lord, 
I'm giving you access to everything. You've got me. Everything about me is at your disposal. I am a living sacrifice, Romans 12, 1. I say, Lord, you've got access to everything. I'm able to see your hand as it works in, in the affairs of my life. And then as I, as I yield myself to him, as I get to know God, I am changed into the image of Christ. It says we are changed. That is a, a passive word in the Greek, which means that I'm not the one performing the action. I am being changed by someone else. Who changes me to be more like Christ? The Holy Spirit. Of God. Holy Spirit right? As I walk in the Spirit, I won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. I'll be made more into the image of, of Christ. Again, we go back to our, our, our illustration of the hot air balloon. When you get into the hot air balloon, do you cause the balloon to fly? No. You fly. Why? Because balloons are able to fly. You are you are you are lifted. You aren't lifting, you are lifted. The same principle when you walk in the spirit and you are you are being made more like Christ. It's not, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna etch out all of the sin in my life so that I can be more like Christ. That will lead to a, a legalism. But you say, I'm going to allow God to change me into the image of his dear son. I'm not to be conformed to this world. Again, Romans 12, 2. I'm to be transformed. The same, the same Greek word that is translated changed here in our, in our, in our verse, um, here in, uh, here in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, that word changed is the same word that is used transformed uh, in Romans 12, 2. So we have our alteration. Now we have our agent. We're changed into the changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the of the Lord. Galatians 5 16. This I say then, walk in the flesh in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. A quote from page 170, he says, Walking is nothing more than a series of reiterated steps. Walking in the Spirit is taking one step of faith after another. What is the first step in the journey of becoming more like Christ? Salvation. Salvation. We, we've been calling it justification, which is the act uh, that I am declared righteous in Christ. I, I am justified. That's my first step. What's the next step of sanctification? What's gonna, it's going to be different, right? For, for each and every person. To, to walk, walking is a series of reiterated steps. If, if I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in shape, I'm going to start running this week, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run on a regular basis, and, and, I, and I get all dressed up in what I run in, and I go out the door and I go, well, I'm glad that's over. You ever try that? Some of you are nodding your heads like, I've done that. <laughs> That's, it, can I say that I am, I am running or I am walking if I do this? No, it's a, it's a series of reiterated steps. I'm going to step, and then I'm going to step. And, and the faster I take those steps, that means I'm running. When I slow down, I'm walking. But it has to be a series of obedience that's what sanctification is. It starts with justification. That's the first step. And then it's step after step after step of obedience. As we get into God's word, we realize this part of my life doesn't line up with God's word. We take the step of aligning with God's word. We take more and more steps. Sanctification. A series of steps of faith. Now let's come here to day five. And let's look at, uh, on page 173, page 173, day five, we'll start with a quote here. He says on, on page 173, the process of becoming more like Christ may not be exactly what you think. God's strength doesn't make us inherently strong. Our flesh will remain with us until the day we go to heaven. What God promises is overcoming power. 
when he says, as I was reading through this, and I've, I've gone through living the exchange before, but as I was reading through, I got to this, this quote on page 173, and I had to think about it for a little bit. When he says, the process of becoming more like Christ may not be exactly what you think. God's strength doesn't make us inherently strong. What, is, what does that mean? Because at first glance, I kind of take issue with this. I say, well, no, in all things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. And I, I've got Bible verses. But, but what does he mean by this? Because I, I, this is right. But what does he mean when he says that the, the, the strength, uh, God's strength doesn't make us inherently strong? A lot of it comes down to where you put the emphasis in this sentence. What do you think? How, how, can, how can we say that the, the strength of God doesn't make me inherently strong? Because we still have sin. We still have sin. Let, let me read this a little bit different. I'm going to put emphasis and see if this opens it up. He says, God's strength doesn't make us inherently strong. Okay? It's still him. Still it's him. still him. That's the point. It's not, well, I trusted Jesus, and now I'm super saint. That's not how it works. And you know that. I know that. It, the, to say, well, I'm walking in the Spirit doesn't, I can't say, well, well, now I am a strong individual. Nope. Nope. Just like me getting into the basket of the hot air balloon, and I say, I am no longer affected by gravity. You are. Step out of the basket and see. Right? I am still. It doesn't change who I am and give me all of the. Uh, it doesn't take away my flesh. I still have the flesh. The strength that God gives doesn't make me inherently strong. It's me who is weak depending on his strength. I say, Lord, I can't do this. Lord, I can't live a holy life in 2021. Have you seen all of the filth and the smut and the garbage that is surrounding us? Have you seen what's going on in America? Lord, I can't do this, but you can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Just as the hot air balloon overcomes the law of gravity, so the enabling of the Spirit can, in, can overcome the law of indwelling sin. He gives us a good illustration here. In Numbers 21, uh, we have a biblical illustration of the overcoming power of Christ and, and how it works. The overcoming power of Christ. Numbers 21, verse 7. Uh, this is when the, the, uh, the people uh, of Israel had, had gone against God. They'd rebelled against God, so he sent fiery serpents into their midst. And the serpents were biting them, and people were dropping dead all over the camp. And verse 7 says, Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Look at this next phrase carefully. Pray unto, pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. They had done wrong. They've sinned. They've sinned against God. Take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Verse 8. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent. And set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he had beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So, a question. From this passage, what did the people want God to do for them? Take, take away the serpent. Did God provide for the safety of the people? How exactly? Was it what the people asked for? Did God take away the serpents? No. No, what did he do? He, he gave them some. He said, look, you, you look at the serpent. You look at the serpent on the pole and you'll live. God doesn't give us victory by taking away all of, the, all of the, the fleshly temptations around us. Just as this is the case, God didn't, God didn't fix the problem by removing the snakes. God fixed the problem by giving them a, a means of healing. If you get bitten by a snake, and everybody's getting bitten by snakes, if you, when you realize, oh no, you look at the snake, and what? You live. 
It's not real complicated, is it? We sing a song. Look and live. Pretty easy. And yet, sometimes we, we overcomplicate things in the Christian life. God didn't choose to take away the snakes. Instead, he gave the antidote. It was available to all those who would look. So, we come to John chapter 3, and this is an illustration that God used. As Moses, John 3, 14 says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Who's this talking about? Yeah. Let's walk with me through the illustration. I have a problem. It's going to, it's going to mean my destruction. But it wasn't a snake bite. What was it? What's the big sin? I have a big problem. I have sin. And, and God didn't take away the sin. He instead sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be born as a man, to live amongst men, and to die as a man for my sins. And if I will look to him, then I can have healing, right? That's what, that's what this is saying. God doesn't remove all of the sin from our surroundings. Rather, he offers his overcoming power to all who will accept it by faith. Remember Colossians 2, 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus our Lord, so walk ye in him. How, how do you receive justification? By faith. How are you going to receive victory? By faith. You, you can't get past it. As you receive Christ, so you have to walk in him. The step of faith that first step, justification, the next step, sanctification, and the next steps that follow thereafter, all sanctification, all by faith. All looking at Christ as the one who can enable me to do what I need to do. The Christian life is like running a marathon. So the illustration is not original to me, obviously. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What are the three things in this verse that we need to do in order to run this race, the Christian life, efficiently? What do we have to do? Lay aside, the sin. Lay aside every weight, the sin which does so easily beset us. It's the next one. Run with patience, the next verb. And, and what's the next one? Looking unto Jesus. So, unto Lay aside the weight and the sin, and to run with patience, and to look to Jesus. All of these. On page 174, he says, Notice the weights we are to lay aside are in addition to besetting sin. <clears throat> the weights are not necessarily things that are wrong, but things that hinder our progress. As I was, as I was uh, going over this, it's, it's interesting to me. Did, did you watch the Olympics at all this past year? If you watched the Olympics, you saw, uh, I, was, I was kind of interested. Skateboarding made its, its debut into the Olympics. I struggle with thinking of skateboarding as a sport, but I, get, I can't do it, so I guess it is. But as I was watching these people who were skateboarding, you know what almost all of the, the skateboard athletes were carrying? A cell phone. All of them had their cell phone in their pocket, and they would get out, and they, were, they, would, they would adjust something on their phone. They got their, their earphones in, and then they would go, and they would skate with a cell phone in their pocket. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. I would venture to say that that's one of the only Olympic sports where, where you put your cell phone in your pocket. You, know, you don't see that on, in track and field, do you? You don't see the people who are going to be out there running a race. You did, when Usain Bolt was running, you didn't see him pull out his cell phone and adjust something and then put it back in his pocket. Why? Is it because cell phones are evil? No. no. Why, why, would, why would somebody who's trying to run for, for just hair-sized portions of a second, why would they not carry their cell phone? 
It's a way, nothing wrong with it. If, if you can skateboard with it, that's fine. But you, you shouldn't run with it. Why? Because it's just, it's weight. It's additional weight. It's, it's constricting. You got this in, I don't even think track suits have pockets. Uh, but uh, so you've got this, this phone. You're going to try to figure out how to run with it. It's not something that's necessarily wrong. It's just not helpful to the end goal. And, and just as he says here on page 174 and in Hebrews, we are to lay aside the sins. Obviously, obviously you should lay aside sin. <laughs> that, that, it's, so, it's so plain and open and simple that it, it should go without saying, hey, don't, don't try to walk in the spirit and try to sin at the same time. That, that doesn't work. But also, in addition to the sin that so easily besets us, you need to set aside the weights, the things that, well, there's, there's nothing wrong with this, but it's not helping me to my end goal. This is not, this is not forwarding my, my race. This isn't helping me in my race. If anything, it's holding me back. It's not that it's sin. It's just that it's not helpful to the end goal. On page 175, there's a list. A list of all of the illustrations that have been used in this Bible study thus far relating to the spirit-filled life. I have, I have five of them here. We started, he has the, the law of aerodynamics. We have been referring to this with the hot air balloon because I think it's a little bit easier. It's just one step. Hot air rises, okay? When you walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why? Because you are overcoming the, the law of sin, the law of indwelling sin. He has in here, and we, we, we went over this very quickly, the idea of glasses to someone to overcome nearsightedness or farsightedness. Maybe you remember the illustration that we gave of fire changing the characteristics of cold steel. You take, a, you take an iron rod, and it's just sitting in your garage, and try to, try to bend it. No, not going to work. But you take it and you get it hot enough and you can tie it in a knot, right? Why? Because fire changes how it is. Light overcomes a dark room. When I walked into the library, there aren't any windows to the outside in here. So when I walk in here, I flip on the light and the room is immediately bright. I didn't have to take time to shovel out darkness. The light got rid of it. And then also we had the, the illustration of Mr. Fact, Mr. Faith, and Mr. Feeling. Remember this? Fact walks in front. Faith looks at fact. When faith turns to check out how feeling's doing, it might fall off the wall. But if you keep them in the right order, things work well. In each of the illustrations, each of the five illustrations that you have listed here on page 175, what happens when you stop doing the thing? How do I make my glasses ineffective? Take them off. Are they doing me any good? No. When, when I'm in the hot air balloon, how do I make it not work for me? Step out. When, when, I have, uh, when, I, when I'm trying to mold and, and, and bend iron into the shape that I want it to be, how do I, how do I make that much, much more difficult? Take it out of the fire. Let it cool off. What happens when we stop depending on God's overcoming power? Shoo, you go down, right? You, you, can't, you don't overcome him. Again, what we said earlier, the strength that God gives you doesn't make you inherently strong. It, it enables you to accomplish what God would have you to do. As we walk in the spirit, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And when I step out of that, I'm putting myself back in the position where I can't accomplish what I'm supposed to, which is walking in the Spirit. Page 175, he says, You can experience a Spirit-filled life as you keep Jesus as Lord of your life, continually surrendering your will to His. Spirit-filled living is not attained by pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. The strength to live in victory resides in the resurrected Lord who lives in you. Only as I access his power will I have victory in my life. 
when I say, I got this, I'm stepping out of the basket. I'm taking the glasses off. I'm pulling the iron out of the fire. I'm looking at feeling rather than fact. And everything goes, goes to pieces. It's not supposed to work in my strength. If just like, why doesn't God allow us to work for salvation? What does Ephesians 2, 9 tell us? 2, 8 and 9. Right, so I, why doesn't God want me to be able to work for my salvation and you be able to work for your salvation? He says, lest any man should boast. Well, could you imagine if we could work for salvation? We get to heaven and we're all sitting around saying, well, I did this. Well, I did this. I deserve a better place. God didn't want that. So when we're sitting in heaven and we say, hey, hey, Mark, how'd you get here? Well, I trusted Jesus as my personal Savior and he saved me. Well, me too. Hey, that's what everybody here did. Everybody in here, they only trusted Jesus as their personal Savior, and he saved them. It wasn't by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy that he saves us. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. So take the same idea, because it does cross over. If I could work hard for my sanctification, what do you think I'd do? Yeah, get a big head and say, well, I have victory in my life because I walk with God. And say, well, I walk with God too. And we get together and, and we have this big mutual pride fest. Does that bring glory to God? No. So, so God made it. So if I say, hey, I've been having victory lately. Here's why. Because Christ lives in me. He's been giving me victory. As I've taken steps of obedience, he's given me strength to, to walk in the Spirit. That's how it works. Just like salvation is by grace through faith, so is daily living by grace through faith. Matthew eleven twenty eight says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. <laughs> Only with him. Is the yoke of Christ heavy for you by yourself? It's not just heavy, it's impossibly heavy. You can't do it. But with Christ, if you have Christ, in the yoke is his illustration. If you're in the yoke with Christ, who's doing the work? Christ, right? If, if I went out and I hooked myself up to a mule and I got down next to a mule and, and I'm going to plow a little patch of a garden and, and I get done and I say, whoo, did you see what I did? If a mule could talk, what would it say? <laughs> You're crazy. Look what I did, right? And if I get to the end of my Christian life and I say, whoo, look what I did. Oh, it, oh, the only thing that I can say, look what I did, is all the mess-ups. Because Christ's power... His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Not because it's light to me, but because in him we can have victory. We'll finish up just one more brief thought next week on page 176. So read, read ahead there because there's some, some interesting things that we need to remember. And then we'll go into our next lesson uh, here next week. All right. Now, I know this is a little bit different of a setting and you kind of, we kind of have to get into the groove of meeting here in the library, a little bit different of a setting. But as we just mentioned, where two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst. So the church is not in the church building, but it's here. And God is here, and I appreciate you coming out, and you're placing a premium on God's word and on fellowship here this morning. But let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for... Your word, once again, Lord, we thank you for the truths and the principles that we've seen. We thank you that in Christ all things are possible. Lord, that it's not you just giving us your strength to do our will. But, Lord, it's you allowing your strength to be, to be given through us to have us do as you would have us do. Lord, I pray that you would help us to walk in the Spirit, that we wouldn't, uh, that we wouldn't try to step out on our own, that we wouldn't allow pride to get in the way, but Lord, that we would take the next step of obedience and the next step and the next step. Lord, I pray that you would receive glory and honor out of our lives. Be with us now as we prepare for the main service in Jesus' name.